Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dulte Daherty and in this podcast series, I will be speaking to investors, advisors, entrepreneurs and recruiters who are based all over the world and we'll be discussing how to set up, scale and operate a world-class recruitment company. Yesterday I was in Brighton, it's just down the road from me, and I held a roundtable discussion which we got videoed, um, professionally videoed actually, and it was Roy Ripper, the recruitment author, trainer and advisor, Mark Sanowski, who is a recruitment entrepreneur that's had successful exits and currently runs and invests a few different recruitment firms um, locally and globally, and Backdoor Barry, the recruiter's lawyer. And it was just a brilliant, brilliant experience. Um, they've all been in the industry for over 20 years. And we sat down, we had a couple of pints. The whole thing's videoed and we'll be releasing it um, bit by bit over the next period of time. But three great characters. I learned a lot from, from yesterday's chat and it was so interesting getting... Mark's perspective on running a multi multi million dollar recruitment firm and how managing people within that what what that what that whole experience is like and what advice he has on that to speaking to Roy who advises smaller uh, he, has, he advises larger firms as well but lots of independent recruiters lots of medium sized firms and and figuring out like what the differences are what's around the corner like what's the secret sauce and how to scale a company was what i really wanted to get out of mark and and we did and it was great and i'm buzzing from doing it and i've had all three of them on the podcast and what i want to do this year is once a month or once every two months is get a professional videography team get three people that have been on the podcast already put them on a table put on a few drinks and create a topic and see where it goes. So we're going to do a bit more of that. That's what we we didn't do that in New York. In New York, it was probably a bit more business focused for us uh, in terms of our own lead generation and trying to get recruiters to, uh, to to help them move to America. And and that was amazing. And all the footage from that's coming out. And we're going to do the exact same thing in LA later in the year. So that's booked. And then I'm gonna stay in Florida for a little bit and drive to DSP who's been on the podcast here and uh, I'm going to do a bit of a day with him and we're going to then drive down to the Mullings group um, Joe Mullings, he's, if you're not follow, following him and what he does in recruitment you need to start doing it so I'm going to try and do a day in the life with him and you know just see what it's like under the hood of a world-class boutique agency and that's certainly what he has there and the way he goes about things so i really want to bring the podcast to life and and that's what we're going to do and then also in june i'm going for i'm going to lisbon for a wedding but luckily dave dave hume is around so we're going to talk about what it's like to be a solo operator in recruitment and work and live remotely and you know creating the life of your dreams and how you can go about that and we're gonna discuss that in detail and have a bit of crack so really excited have loads of plans to to bring all the guests that have come on and will come on and put them into a scenario where they're where they're learning from each other, and we're creating great content and bringing the whole thing to life. So, so that's a, that's the plan. Um, I don't know how I'm going to make any money out of this, um, but I can afford to do these things with our existing business. And if it leads to something down the road, then great. If not, I'm going to have a blast doing it. But uh, today's guest, Steve Beckett, legend, source breaker, great product, um, great story. I hope you all enjoy this one. He uh, He's well known in the industry and we had a great, great interview. And I'd love to get him and a couple of the other tech startups within the recruitment sphere to, around a table. And I think we'll probably do that as well. And, you know, just to try and inform people 
Like what is what tech out there can you get to reduce your cost and increase your margins? And there's a few amazing products out there. We've had a few of them on the on the podcast, the like Candidate ID and Cube nineteen. And uh yeah, and we'll probably probably have a couple more on over the next while. But uh that's it for today. I'm gonna get on the recruiting brain food uh, live stream later with uh, with our man Hung Lee to talk about digital nomadism and what it was like for us when we set up in Guatemala and lived in Thailand and did all those amazing things before kids and all that jazz before I down here in the south of England living in a village with two screaming kids when we were living the dream on the road. So I'm going to do a bit of reminiscing with Hung Lee live on his show at four o'clock and and then that's it so appreciate i've just been rambling for a little bit so i hope you all enjoy this have an amazing weekend and if you're enjoying the podcast or you want me to cover anything i'm easily contactable hit me up on linkedin and you know you know just love speaking to people who are listening to the podcast or anybody who wants to talk about anything in the industry I'm all ears. If you want to come on the podcast too, just hit me up. All right. Have a fantastic weekend. Steve Beckett, how are you? Yeah, really good. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. We had a bit of a a roundtable event in uh, Brighton yesterday. I may have had a beer or two afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Good place to have one. It's all backdoor backdoor Barry's fault. <laughs> oh, blame blame the lawyer every time. <laughs> Always. Yeah. So uh so yeah, we uh we're trying to bring uh the podcast to life. So every time I get a few good guests that are in the same location, I wanna get a get a videography team, put them on a table, give them some beer, <laughs> see what happens. Brilliant. Maybe we'll get maybe we'll get you on and uh, do a tech one someday. Yeah, talking and drinking beer sounds good to me. Count me in. <laughs> Great stuff. So, Friday, hey, have yeah. you got much? Have you got much left of today? Uh, no, we normally finish up about four o'clock and then head for a beer. So, um, we've got a couple more hours to um, to go, and then uh, yeah, and then beer o'clock. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm doing a, an appearance on recruiting brain food at four o'clock. So. Um. I'm I'm on call until then. Right. <laughs> We're going to be talking about digital nomadism. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, something we did at the start of our our journey mm-hmm. when we founded our business. We did it. We lived in Thailand and Cambodia and cool. Guatemala. And now I'm in the south of kids, south of England with two screaming kids. Right. <laughs> it's all gone downhill. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about you, Steve. Cool. Let's talk about you. So, um, you were an S3 for six years? Yeah, that's right. Doing IT infrastructure. I did that myself for about four years. Mm-hmm. So, uh, did all that, all that recruiting for all those CCNA boys. Yeah, good stuff. Tell me the crack. Why did that? Uh, How'd you get into recruitment? Why'd you why'd you join S3? So I was um, I was working as an estate agent before joining uh, joining S3. And I was doing a viewing with a guy who was looking to buy, um, looking to buy a flat. And we just got chatting and he just asked me how much I earned and the kind of hours I worked and, and when I worked. Um, so I told him and he basically sold me the dream as people from S3 tend to do. Um, and just said, you can earn way more money um, doing recruitment. Uh, yeah. So I thought that sounds interesting. Um, <laughs> so he was, uh, he was a guy from uh, Progressive called Sanjay Ryan Donny. Um, he's now, now does his own thing, but, so I went and interviewed at Progressive, at Computer Futures, and uh, JP Gray, yeah. um, and then yeah, off I went from there. Do you think? Uh, do you think a lot of business owners could probably put Rector Rex out of business if they just pretended they wanted to buy a lot of houses? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, just walk around from estate agent to estate agent and drag everyone in. Because I always look at like sales jobs like that, you know, like so. Yeah, recruitment's kind of a wee bit further up the food chain than uh, than than real estate. Mm-hmm. Being a stock trader is a bit further up there food chain than being a, a recruiter yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. so it's uh it's about it's about like prizing somebody to the next sales job isn't it yeah absolutely how do you how do you find those early years that uh, 
what type of characters were you working with in S3? I'm, I'm guessing... I'm guessing half of them have their own recruitment companies now. Yeah, pretty much. I think it's this... Um, the who's who, right? Yeah, exactly. There's no big secret that um, a hell of a lot of entrepreneurs have come out of, uh, of the S3 group. So it's um, it's definitely a really good training ground yeah, for that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think S3 also has, a, I suppose, a bit of a history of yeah, hiring pretty big personalities. So I was definitely surrounded by... Um, yeah, lots of big personalities. It's quite interesting to see one of those big personalities has actually gone on now. He's um, first team coach at Fulham in the Premier League. So he's really, had, yeah, quite an interesting career change from um, BDing the NHS to now sitting on the um, on the coach's bench for uh, for Fulham in the Premier League. What's his name? So his name's Matthew Wells. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so a um, little bit jealous of him, but... Um, it's yeah. all right, you've done all right. Who else was in that room? Anybody else at that we, we'd know as household names in, uh, in, in recruitment today? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know about actually household names. I'm probably doing someone a massive disservice here. Um, <laughs> household but was, names, but you, know, yeah. you know, in our world. Yeah, so there was, um, yeah, it was uh, John Pullen, who went on to, um, to do his own thing very, very successfully, um, then worked under... You know, a few rungs under, but under David Reese within the real staffing group, who's now on the board at, um, at S3. Um, and yeah, a number of other people like Stephen Quinn, um, who's CEO of America, is in S3 as well. Was the he's, um, he's recently uh, he, he, he got uh, exited, didn't he? He did, yeah. I think he was, he was CEO of um, of America's, and um, yeah, I think now is he's, he's, you know, he's now doing his own thing. Um, but he was managing director of, of real staffing when I stepped into that brand. He's from uh, he's from my local area. Okay, yeah, I think he's well. He, I'm from I'm from just down the road. He's from Derry. Mm-hmm. I've heard great I've heard great things about him. Yeah, the really good guy. Um, Yeah, the people that were uh, yeah were in the leadership team from my time at S3 were uh, yeah, incredibly inspirational people. Really good to work with, um, and yeah, great great motivators. Uh, yeah. But to the point that they almost they motivate everybody to go and set up their own businesses because there's <laughs> a plus and a minus, I think, for S3. Yeah, my recent trip to New York was basically a who's who of who used to work for S3. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and, uh, I met I met your I met your buddy out there, hey? Oh uh, yeah, Lewis Lyons. Yeah. That's like signing Ronaldo, isn't it? Yeah, for Opus. Is, uh, yeah, I said to Jack, um, Jack Rawcliffe, who's uh, one of the managing directors of Opus, about. What a great signing, yeah, Lewis is. He's definitely a name to look out for over the next few years or so. Um, I think, yeah, he's but Lewis, although he joined recruitment after me, was always a massive example to me of what hard work looked like. A lot of people did the whole work hard, play hard thing, but you know, during the working day, you literally couldn't get a conversation with him. He just used to ignore everybody, eyes on the screen, you know, phone, wow. phone down, was just probably the most relentless worker I've, um, yeah, I've ever worked with. So, Opus have got a really good signing there, definitely. Yeah. Uh, whenever you're looking for somebody like that, you want to see like how how do they deal with adversity? And mm. you know, he, me and him both f- faced adversity in Calgary. Right. And uh, I will. I was only there for a bit. He was only there for a bit. Mm. So we we shared some stories of what that was like when the oil price crashed. Yeah. I, I was. I was. It was pretty. It was pretty tough going. Pretty rough, um, right. But he he went on to go to Houston and then yeah he and then and then to New York and his. His wife, uh, wife works for Opus, uh, or not Opus? Sorry, uh, Uber. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, just he's got. When when you get to a certain stage in in your career, you want to be behind a company that has a growth trajectory. Definitely, they're funded, and that if they're heading to an exit, you're going to get to that point at some stage, and that's 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 the kind of position he's in now. Mm-hmm. And as you said, that's from years and years of hard work, and then taking a chance so he's building this team over there now and i really enjoyed meeting him yeah and i, I we left the meeting kind of just a bit energized mm-hmm. by his energy yeah and and that doesn't always happen you know and, and i thought wow i really want to find this guy some people because he just was he's just a good just a good guy you know yeah he's like so straight up and down like really um really good ethics relentless hard worker he's somebody that i would work for uh in a heartbeat um yeah really inspirational really fair yeah i can't can't speak more highly of him yeah, and when and when you break America, you're going to pull him out of all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I made a promise to Jack that I wouldn't do that. So uh, I bet you did. Yeah, I bet you. Uh, hopefully, I'll be uh, good to my word. But no yeah. promises, Jack. <laughs> Very good. So, um, I'm not going to go too much into your what it was like being an IT recruiter mm-hmm. in in S3, mainly because I won't learn a tremendous amount from that. 
But mm-hmm. what I do want to kind of get is, where did you find the balls <laughs> to set up set up a technology company? Yeah. Um, so I think a, a really good phrase uh, that I heard was, "Courage isn't um, taking a risk." Uh, isn't, courage isn't not being afraid courage is being afraid and still doing it anyway so i'd like to say like it's this really courageous thing but i've got um i suppose quite a big appetite for risk anyway and i thought you know worst case scenario um if it doesn't go right i've just made myself a lot more employable than um you know than i was beforehand because you know i've gone and tried to set up a company will have learned a load of new things um and off i go so i kind of you know thought you know this will go well but then at the same time i thought if it doesn't go well I'm not, you know, you know, it's not like I'm going to struggle for a job. Everybody's always looking for uh, recruiters. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, um, I thought, you know, let's give this a go. Could be fun. Um, and if not, I'll learn a lot on the way anyway. Where'd the idea come from? Um, so the idea came when I left S3 originally, I actually left with the intention to set up a recruitment company. Um, so I had a, a six month non-compete clause. So I wanted to do a couple of things that would really give me a differentiator in the market. Um, so I've always been a bit more techy or nerdy, I suppose, than, um, than most salespeople. So um, I wanted to have a couple of differentiators. So one of the things I did was take a couple of qualifications relevant to the industry that I was recruiting into. So I took the Cisco TCNA qualification and then took the um, Microsoft MCP certifications. So just crammed and studied really hard for those. The idea being that, you know, being able to understand your market and demonstrate you've committed to it. Um, you know, is a, is a good differentiator from the, the thousands of recruiters out there. And then the other thing that I did, um, I love spreadsheets more than it's healthy for anybody in the world to love a spreadsheet. Um, and so what I set about doing was building a couple of really basic recruiting tools on uh, spreadsheets. The idea was that uh, in-house recruiters would use these spreadsheet tools, they'd have my company logo, all that information on, on the tools. They'd use these tools, and when they're, they're struggling to find candidates, the idea being that they would contact the company whose brand they see every single day, um, as opposed to you know the the countless agencies that are cold calling you know day in day mm. out. So it was to do traditional recruitment, but to have a couple of strings to my bow that were different to everybody else. That was the idea mm. behind it. Um, so I put this initial spreadsheet tool up on my company website, where you could just put in your details to download it, and I just posted on LinkedIn saying, "Hi." Uh, free recruitment tool for anybody who wants to download it just click here chuck in your details uh, and off you go and it just went absolutely nuts overnight so people at jp morgan google ebay facebook salesforce <coughs> started using this free recruitment tool um and it just massively opened my eyes to this huge opportunity to build a, a company based around a search focused recruitment tool um so yeah with that pretty high appetite for risk i so, decided um, so there was a light bulb moment right there and then yeah exactly um it was just it was literally so that, i mean i mentioned those companies but it was pretty much a who's who of you know billion pounds plus companies all downloaded the tool it's over 500 downloads in 48 hours um it's like there is massive demand here for a you know a search-based recruitment tool um so i thought you know if i can make as much money as i would in recruitment but selling technology and i never have to speak to anyone in hr ever again that may be a good thing um obviously being an it contract recruiter for a number of years you know you're not hr's best friend by any means so um yeah so that was that was the the initial thing behind it and then uh i went obviously i couldn't code by any means um yeah so so let's uh, just on that right so you're you're there you've kind of got proof of concept in terms of or sorry proof of, of market yeah. need uh, you're still way far away from doing proof of concept and mm-hmm. making it making it happen mm-hmm. when we set up recruitment businesses look it's easy to look six months and say i can be profitable within the x amount if i place this amount of people mm-hmm. but how financially could you view the next year in terms of like i'm gonna Firstly, I haven't even built this thing properly yeah. to be able to sell it. Yeah. So, like, talk me through the finances at this stage. What, what, what's your thoughts? How did you go about it? What, what, like, how are you going to make sure that you're still feeding yourself? Yeah. So, um, so one of the things I did before I left S3 was I saved up a load of money. Um, didn't do anything socially for quite some time. Um, I also sold my flat and you know property. This was five, six years ago. Um. So property had gone up a good amount since I bought my flat. So I had a bit of equity available from that. 
So that got us started. But obviously, it's quite expensive to build uh, technology solutions. So I yeah. basically channeled my love of spreadsheets into building a load of other uh, spreadsheet tools. So some things that people still ask us about four or five years on, um, if we can, if they can have them. Um, so names that some people will be familiar with, like the Market Mapper. So you could basically with the Market Mapping tool, you could map out the top hundred employers of any skill set in any location in the world in about five minutes. Uh, so that was a particularly popular tool. Um, we had other ones which um, used to organise information from certain social media sites very, very quickly um, and in a, in a list format and some other tools as well. And so what we did, they were relatively low cost to build, but incredibly high value to recruiters. So if you could say to a recruiter, right, any market in the world, you can build the top list of top 100 employees of that skill set in five minutes. That's obviously saves you know weeks, months of work for a recruiter. So we're able to commercialize a load of spreadsheets that... Um, you know, in the yeah. made hundreds of thousands of pounds from, but they were able to fund us building the proper software um, that we, you know, that we sell today. And you say we, who, who, who was, who's the we? So, sorry. So I, um, I so basically, cause I couldn't code a thing. Um, I spoke to an old school friend of mine, Dave Sherlock, uh, and just said, Dave, do you fancy building a technology company? Uh, he's like, all right, let's go for it. Um, literally, neither of us with the faintest clue how to build a technology company, but with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, yeah. So I did actually sit down with him. I did decide that I was going to do some of the development and that lasted about 15 minutes or so. Um, <laughs> so I did that. I was probably better suited to sales than I was to, um, to, to writing code. Uh, yeah. yeah, so he was the person that I initially set the business up with. All right. In- interesting. Okay, so, so the two, two years there. Mm-hmm. Then uh, what, was, what was next? Like, did you have to go get funding at this stage? Do, do, do you have to, like, because developers aren't, Developers aren't cheap. No. Basing yourself in London isn't cheap. No, absolutely. So we decided, rightly or wrongly, at that point, that we would bootstrap our way to get the product to market. Um, that's actually served us really well further down the line. When speaking to future investors, they really liked the fact that we didn't take funding early on. And first of all, took the risk with our own capital, but also it taught us that financial discipline of only spend money on things that are absolutely essential because we had very limited money to spend we had to make sure we spent money really wisely so that stood us in really good stead with you know with future investors so what we did was um coming from a recruitment background we we're obviously able to find good developers so we used the um the freelancer websites um, so things like upwork people per hour that kind of site and put a job up essentially saying this is what we need you know additional development support with and we've got loads and loads of responses people saying yeah we can do this we can do this we can do this and then there was one development company that replied saying you need to give us a more detailed brief we'll assess the brief then we'll let you know if we want to work on it so straight away we're different to everybody else by not just trying to you know grab the work but by saying give us some proper information and we'll do it so we did a bit of due diligence on them looked at their presence on um the software communities how much they contributed saw that they were really credible and then so then dave worked alongside the offshore developers to get the initial product built we managed Mm. to get that product to market without taking any external funding Uh, wow and then so we're able to get some early adopters who got really good results from it so when we did take our first bit of angel funding we were able to say you know not only do we have a piece of SaaS software that people are parting with money for. But we're also, to de- also able to demonstrate we've made, you know, several hundred thousand pounds from selling spreadsheets. And I think people felt, you know, if, they, if these guys can sell spreadsheets for this amount of money, then, um, <laughs> you know, hopefully they can sell software for that as well. And that, that got us that initial investment after we got the product to market. Was it, uh, was it always plain sailing? Absolutely not, no. Um, so... Um, there, were, <laughs> there were a load of things that happened. I've basically learned over the years to just everything that's happened just panic give me a couple of disaster stories well so i mean i don't know about a disaster but there was definitely sleepless nights and a lot of panic so we'd set about building this piece of software uh, which is a uh, a search tool uh, which is relatively basic the first um the first version that we built um so we were getting ready to get the product to market we're going to charge um you know charge a reasonable amount of money for this product and then literally the week before we went to market with it social talent released a free search tool um so we were like oh uh this is not good news we're about to go to market with a paid for tool and a company with a much bigger presence much more recognized brand name has actually released something you know free of charge so that was um that was right right in that moment do you you just 
get your developer right into their like having a look at their code trying to see if there's anything that they're doing that's better than yours are you panicking just just to try to reconfirm that you're on the right track here so i think them bringing out search tool first of all validated that you know there's demand for it which we kind of knew anyway because of the previous products that we built but um yeah we definitely panicked um i certainly wouldn't say on a podcast that we you know look at other people's products but um you know, <laughs> but you do uh, but other people <laughs> told us about the kind of features that the product had and how it worked and that kind of thing um yeah. and um i think it was the, the reason for the panic was an experience more than anything else and um, mm. you know nowadays stuff happens people bring out new tools new products and you don't even blink about it because first of all um there's room for everybody in the market so even if somebody does bring something else out you know there's always room there's, there's no shortage of recruitment agencies to sell to so yeah um, yeah, definitely. We don't we don't tend to panic now when other products come out, but it was just yeah, pure inexperience and thinking, God, because there's this free tool out, we won't, you know, this this could you know crush us before we've even started. Uh, but what we soon found out is, like I say, there's plenty of space for everyone, and you know, the social talent tool is a great tool. Um, and I think the way that we, you know, both companies approached it was slightly different. So there was value for some people on the social talent one, and there's value for other people on the source breaker one. So. Um, mm. We realized then that actually that wasn't going to you know, cause a serious harm. Um, but that was definitely, you know, when you're so excited about releasing this great yeah. stuff and all this kind of thing, and someone releases something similar but very different um, for free the week before, it was a bit crushing, but, um, you know, it turned out to not be a major problem. How, how did you find the transition from selling to executives to selling to search firm owners? Um, to be honest, it was way, way easier. Um, so the sales bit was, was yeah, I suppose less challenging. Obviously, I haven't worked in sales for a number of years. No, but with the recruitment industry, as you mentioned, with the S3 alumni, there was my, my own network of people that I knew straight away that I could get on the phone to. But then there was also their network as well. So straight away, <laughs> you had hundreds of people you could call up and say, hi there, I'm also from S3, um, blah, blah, blah. And it, it, it just made getting in the door a lot easier. Um, I targeted a couple of members groups as well early on, uh, and that opened the door to a lot of uh, a lot of prospects. And what that allow, allowed us to do was do a good job with a couple of those member groups early on. Yeah. They then you, sell you mean like the jobs. recruitment network or people like Pardon? that or member groups? Yeah, exactly. So, th so the the first one we targeted was the um, was the RDLC, um, and they've got yeah, that's a, there's a lot of XS3 people involved in that so did a good job there with a few of them and then word spread and that really helped develop it but i think selling to sales people for me i find an absolute dream um i think when i was doing uh, you know it contract recruitment that was great selling to hr people selling to it directors they're not necessarily as you know they don't have the big personalities as often as you find with recruitment business owners so mm. you can build that rapport you, you know no doubt find it yourself you can build that rapport with recruitment business owners incredibly quickly and within mm. you know 10 15 minutes of talking to somebody have built up a really good rapport like you've known them for years um so i'm always i'm always reminding our software sales guys upstairs just how easy they've got it compared to um to, you know compared to the life of a recruiter <laughs> i can imagine so the just on it sounds like you're you're starting to hit critical mass now mm -hmm. what how, like what thing in the business has really excited you or energized your growth over the past or over the past 12 months mm -hmm. even more so than it was in, in a couple of years like why now has everything clicked into place so i think initially we we as i say we built the product issue with offshore developers so i ended up this is about, about three years or so ago i ended up buying out my uh, original co-founder he's still got some shares but um he um yeah, he, he wanted to go and fly planes. He's now a private jet pilot. So he's, you know, life's good for him. Um, That's amazing. So, um, so what we did, we then transitioned so that all of the development was being done offshore. So all we had in the UK pretty much was a load of phone bashing salespeople. So it was, a, you, you know, your typical sales floor. Uh, we put together a really strong sales team that were going and selling this product. But over the last 12 months, we've gone from having um, – one in-house developer to a you know full tech and product team of it's now the biggest team in the company so it's about 15 16 people at last count across tech and product um where before we had everybody was custom facing so we, they were either sales or customer success and mm. all the development was done offshore so seeing now you know development team where we've got the head of engineering we've got head of product data scientist we've got a room full of uh, you know a load of developers qa just seeing that whole 
development infrastructure makes us really feel like a full-on tech company as opposed to a bunch of you know phone bashing salespeople uh, yeah selling a product and and i suppose that that requires more investment right yeah definitely i mean we've been fortunate that um through it from day one we've had that focus on generating revenue so even before we built the product we were generating revenue from selling spreadsheets from selling training basically mm. anything we could sell to people to to generate income and that's always been at the core of what we've done is that sales you know that yeah. heavy sales approach and sweating the business yeah exactly so as a result we in comparison to you know this is what vcs and people in the industry tell us in comparison to most tech companies now of our size we've taken comparatively little investment to get where we are because we've been, yeah. we've, you know, stumbled upon a space which isn't especially saturated in the recruitment industry. It's not like with a CRM, you have to wait two, three years before you can close a deal in a lot of places. With Sourcebreaker, we were able to go in, pitch companies and be closing deals that day, the next day, you know, within the week. So we put ourselves in a good position where we've been able to grow our revenues comparatively quickly. And so we've taken some funding, um, but we've never really taken huge amounts. We've never taken an institutional amount. We're actually going for a bigger round now to really turbocharge growth. Uh, yeah. We've got to where we are with um, probably a quarter or less of the funding that would be expected of a company of our size at the moment. Amazing. And what, like, because you've because you've done so well and you have everything in place and you're, you've managed to sweat the business on the way up, uh, in a world where nobody pays for anything anymore <laughs> like are vcs curting you rather than vice versa yeah so we have been uh, yeah so we've been lucky that we've made a bit of um a bit of an impact in the industry so we we do get contacted by people um you know about potentially investing in source breaker we've we've by design stayed away from in- institutional investment to this point i think i've never really heard anybody say Oh, I got in bed with these VCs. They were great guys, really lovely, like great to deal with. Um, I've yeah. unfortunately only ever heard the horror stories. Um, so I've been a bit reluctant uh, to, to, to take that leap. It's not to say that we won't. I think probably in the next 12 to 18 months, we will look at an institutional size round. That may be with an institution or we've got some really good angels involved now. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, they'll be checking behind the couch in a year's time and uh, and be able to stump it up. But We've, uh, yeah, we've tried to avoid the institutions, but um, it's not something that we would, you know, never say never. Um, but yeah, lucky enough to get, you know, to have fairly frequent contact from them. What, uh, what objections do you normally hear when your salespeople are selling to agency recruitment firms? Um, so it's really expensive is one. Um, but to be honest, I, I would be alarmed if we didn't hear that every now and again. I think we are very much you know we like to think of ourselves very much as a premium product and so we'd expect that you know we're seen as you know premium pricing uh, we you know we we 100 percent believe that the product provides massive massive value but we'd always look at ourselves as you know a premium price product um other objections we used to get in the early days because the platform was based on creating better searches for people as a recruiter people are very proud of the fact that they're able to identify candidates in their market and they're the best in the market at what they do yeah when i was initially pitching early on i go in and say well i can help your guys find twice as many candidates three times as many candidates you just get pushed back every single time people say no 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 my guys are really good at search we don't need anything like this um so what we did very early on was just said to people look don't take our word for it. Why don't you send us some of the searches your guys are running? And then what we can do is run a comparison of those searches and then put them to our platform. If we get you extra candidates and better quality candidates, then great, buy it. If we don't, then, you know, no harm done. Um, and I think that was the way that we needed to demonstrate the value of the product because people would always assume my guys know how to do search. Therefore, we're finding everybody. And we needed to, you know, put the evidence in front of them to, um, yeah, to bypass that. But I'd say, yeah, price is... Yeah, everybody always thinks everything's expensive, I think. Uh, yeah. But yeah, pricing and also, you know, we don't need this because, you know, we, we can already find everybody. Interesting. Um, and I, I haven't used your product at so, all. Mm-hmm. And I don't know an awful lot about it, but if it, if it, if it finds people well and creates mm-hmm. lists and does that, does it, does it then extract that data and find their email addresses and all, all, of, all of those things as well? Or... So the way, yeah, so the way that it works, so we don't do any um, extracting of emails or anything like that. We've, um, 
it's very, very tempting to do that kind of thing. But we made a few commercial decisions uh, early on that we wouldn't do anything that would fall foul of, um, first of all, either data laws, but also people like LinkedIn as well. Um, there's a lot of people out there extracting information from LinkedIn, that kind of thing. We, we made a decision to never do that because LinkedIn... Um, don't take kindly to it, and rightly so as well. You know, they're, they're, there's value in their platform. They don't want people nicking stuff off it. So um, we don't extract or go and find email addresses or anything like that. The way the platform works is a recruiter will come onto our platform. They'll say, I'm looking, for example, for a Java developer. We'll identify all the different possible ways that a Java developer could describe themselves as a Java developer. Then what you can do is at the click of a button, it will then run a search for those candidates across all the CV databases that that recruiter has access to. So that would be their CRM, like Bullhorn, um, CV databases like CV Library, Read, that kind of thing. And because we pick up all the different ways that those skills are expressed, we find, as an example, someone might find 50 Java developers on CV Library. With Sourcebreaker, because of the different search techno um, terminology that we put in, that could be 100 candidates, it could be 150 candidates. So people get better results from their existing sources and find candidates they'd otherwise miss. And then what they do from there is they just literally click on a button that says find leads and it finds matching vacancies that match the skill set of the candidates that have just been found. So the idea is it gives them multiple opportunities based mm -hmm. every single candidate they find and find far more candidates as well. Bingo. Sounds great. Um... I, I feel like my own business is a, a dinosaur when I speak to people like yourself. <laughs> um, let, let's not talk about dinosaurs like me. Let's talk about the future. Mm -hmm. Given that products like yourself, like your own, is mm -hmm. is reducing the man hours mm -hmm. in terms of like what it takes to find the person, and you know, then what it takes to maybe find them opportunities and all the rest. And then there's loads of other great products out there mm -hmm. as well. Well, what do you think, like, when, when me and you were, were doing IT infrastructure recruitment, mm -hmm. even, even six years ago, like, it was very much, it's very much like, like the way that they did it in the 90s. How do yeah. you think it's going to, with all this technology now, how do you see the future of, of what that agency recruiter's job looks like? So I think uh, it's good news for agency recruiters. Um, you know, we're all, the reason we're all hired to do agency recruitment is because of our ability to sell. I've not really seen any agency recruiter hired based on their ability to uh, construct searches or trawl the internet or anything like that. The key value, the reason why recruiters earn so much money is their ability to persuade candidates to take jobs and persuade clients to take candidates i think yeah. what technology will do is rather than eliminate recruiters it will allow recruiters to focus almost entirely on the engagement element of it so recruiters will spend far less time trying to identify candidates because technology will be able to do that for you what recruiters will then do is they'll be able to walk in in the morning and have a diary blocked full of calls set up with candidates and calls set up with customers because technology will do the rest so i think recruitment will become even more and more and more phone based because the you know, the technology elements, the bit that involve going on your laptop or your, your PC or Mac, whatever it is, um, and trawling job boards and finding candidates will will diminish. The way that I see it going is essentially what a recruiter will be able to do is feed a job spec into, you know, the, the technology machine. And the, the technology would be able to identify what the key skills are from the job spec. The recruiter would add in any other key elements as well. A search could then be automatically run across all different platforms for candidates that that recruiter has access to. Then when it's returned the search results, then you'll have chatbots and engagement tools that will actually then be able to do the initial engagement with the candidates. The candidate might respond and say, you know, this role sounds interesting, but I need to be able to do, I need to be able to start work at half nine because I dropped the kids off. I need to finish at four on a Friday or something like that. And then the chatbot would have the intelligence to be able to interact with the candidate. Say, yeah, no problem. This company gives you the ability to have flexi time or you can work a day a week from home and do that initial engagement and then get those candidates putting their hand up and saying, do you know what? Not only have you identified that my skills are, uh, are relevant, but actually the, the culture fit is there as well. And then what the machine will be able to do after that is then book in a call with the recruiter and with the candidate for them to actually have that conversation. So the recruiter, rather than doing all that time consuming stuff, going back and forth over email, trawling for searches, they'll come in and they'll have appointments in the diary booked up. And then it's mm. their, their, their role is in that sales bit, which is persuading the candidate to take the job or persuading the client to take the candidate. I do that with uh, virtual assistants right now. Yeah. But uh, how far are we off me being able to do that? 
with uh, with technology. Uh, so I think no more than a year or two. Um, no think, way, stop that. Well, I think there are some pioneering technology companies out there that are on the case with this kind of really? thing. Yeah. Um, so I think it's the, t- the technology is there, definitely on a more basic level to start with. The, the, the AI-driven elements of it, so where a chatbot can have that really intelligent conversation with, um, with the person will be a bit longer, but the more formulaic stuff where mm. it's asking the question, you know, daughter, how many years experience have you got in this sector? Tell me about your experience with this particular skill. Tell me about your experience doing this particular task. That kind of thing is, you know, is, is, is here now in a lot of ways and, is, yeah. is, you know, is only going to get better. Um, do, you, do you think maybe the candidates will have their own bots as well and th- their bots will talk to us? <laughs> I'm sure they will, right? It's quite possible, yeah. I mean, nobody will have to lift a finger thereafter. But I think um, from the candidate side, they'll, uh, they'll no doubt be wanting to ask their own um, questions, but I'm sure there's some clever techies out there Obviously, these developers are in huge demand. We know that ourselves from trying to hire them. Um, they're in huge demand. So it might be they set their own bots up um, to interact with agencies. And if a certain criteria is hit, then it'll alert them and they can actually have a, you know, a full-on conversation with them. That's not something I thought about before. But, um, yeah, yeah, good shout. You should get into technology, daughter. Hey, give me a job, mate. <laughs> um, th- yeah, I think about this stuff a lot. A lot of it terrifies me, though, when I think about it too much. So yeah, I, I, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, uh, you're a guy that puts yourself out there. Um, you know, I've seen 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 a lot of stuff that you've done, mm-hmm. and it's it's benefited your business, building your brand, and doing that. Almost your your personal brand is as strong as your source breaker brand. Right. Thanks very much. I didn't know that, but that's good to hear. Well, like when I started my podcast, I, I spoke to a few people and I said, who, who should I get on? Because at, the, at that point, w- when you start these type of things, you're not as good at interviewing mm-hmm. as, you, as you become. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so you're, you're trying to get people that are easy to interview, that can tell a story. And, and your name just came up like, like repeatedly. And I thought, wow, OK, that's interesting. He must put himself out there a lot if that's the case. And do you think, I'm going somewhere with this question eventually. <laughs> that, given that technology is going to be shaping a lot of the, the rudimentary stuff that we do as recruiters, do you think that the media piece on the front end will become a massive part of what recruiters do? So I think for agency recruiters, there's always a bit of a, a challenge because it's so it's in, in so many cases, it's very, very transactional. Um, their, you know, their interactions with candidates is place a candidate move on to the next one. But I've seen some recruiters doing some really, really good stuff to get their their personal brand out there. And I think if you can do it consistently enough, and yeah, a far better job than I do. I'm, I'm definitely not anywhere near as consistent as a lot of the people who are um, who are out there at the moment by any means. But I think if people get their get their brand out there consistently in them themselves as individuals, um, then I think that can make a you know make a real difference. The more yeah. people are like, you know, what you're doing with uh, the podcast side of things is getting, well, hopefully credible people on talking to credible people, um, you know, then then build your brand as a, you know, as a credible person who knows their industry as well. Um, I think the video side of things and the, the voice side of things, rather than just written interviews and written questions, um, really, really definitely in my mind, um, give me a positive you know, positive view of somebody's personal brand, uh, being able to see their, you know, their face and uh, and listen to their voice and hear them talk credibly about what they what they do, f- for me gives me a positive impression of them, and is then I'm then more likely to use their services uh, mm. for my business. It, I've been thinking about this today, and I was having a conversation with somebody. Um, I'm I'm going on recruiting brain food mm-hmm. after after this and to talk about the the digital nomad stuff. Uh-huh. But he, he Hung Lee is is a bit of a pioneer when it comes to you know the, the recruitment industry and get like creating attention yeah. through con- through content mm-hmm. and he's done it very well. And one of the things that he's that that I I, I like that he's done so he's cre he's taken his people off LinkedIn created a group on Facebook and he's going to have that every like the interview i'm going to do with him today i'm going to be one of a series of people that he's going to have on and right. he's going to be talking to them in different places in the world and it's all going to be live right and i think that that's when linkedin goes live <laughs> i'm going to have to move my podcast like to it being live with the video with maybe like me and you would have a conversation on a split screen i would then 
rip the rip the audio out of that add that to add that to the the, the podcast element save the video that goes to the youtube and mm-hmm. and that's where i see it all going right. like we're just around the corner from everybody having their own media channel i think yeah so that's a uh, that's that's my rabbit hole for today yeah um, <laughs> on uh, on that um what if you had an agency today right mm-hmm. obviously you, you can mention your own your own company what other tools would you use if you were knowing what you know now because like i think what well, anybody who doesn't know the software game doesn't know that like you guys are you you work arm in arm with so many different suppliers like mm-hmm. you all go to the same events like you must rub shoulders with the like lots of great products and like i think you probably over like you must see under the hood at so many agencies and know what's working for different products what what would you choose in terms of the suite of different products if you were to set up a tech recruitment firm t- tomorrow so i think one of the big things for me that we ask recruiters who are recruiting for us where possible to use themselves is um the video interviewing platforms so we get sent a number of cvs for our for our roles and the one of the big big things for us is um not just skills, because we feel that we can teach people skills. So we look for culture fit is absolutely huge for us. And one of the big, big things is humility. That's the, the overriding thing that we look for in the people that, you know, the people that we hire. We're not so fussed about education background or um, prior experience in, in many cases. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to work out for you then. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's a nice, nice idea while it lasts. Really. <laughs> I, th- I thought we were going to ride off into the sunset together there for a minute. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so the, the humility thing is absolutely massive for us because you get hugely talented people out there that um, end up just being a complete grenade in a in an office environment because they're highly capable, but um, they're, even their ego outstrips their capability. And so, we were... and then they can't handle adversity. Yeah, exactly right. So the humility thing's huge for us. And that comes across really well on video interviewing. So platforms like Interview um, are really, really strong. There's other ones out there that are great. So I'd go and have a look at, um, you yeah, know, go and have a look at those. And um, that's a big thing for us to be able to see into you know, candidate before getting them all in for interviews with, you know, fairly consistently hiring. So it's hugely time consuming things. So being able to assess candidates by, you know, an initial video interview is really, really helpful to start with. Um, analytics is, you know, quite well established. Um, platforms like Cube19 are, you know, really, really popular. Um, and then from the, um, from the other side, I'd say things like Volcanic is another one. Um, we know those guys really well. Um, and What do they do? So Volcanic, I'm going to massively undersell what they do, I think, here by saying they do websites for recruitment companies. It's a lot more in-depth than that. Um, there's a huge amount of um, clever stuff that goes on behind the scenes, but I won't do them any justice by trying to um, explain exactly how their stuff works. So I'd, I'd have, a, have a conversation. That's cool. Um, but basically, high-performing companies that we work with use those kind of products. And I think in terms of the CRM side of things, uh, Bullhorn's obviously the you know, fairly established market leader. I think the most important thing with CRM is nowadays is to have a CRM system that you can plug your other products into. So all the products that I mentioned there, things like Source Breaker obviously as well, being able to plug them into your CRM is so, so important. Almost more important than what the actual CRM itself you know, does the you know, CRMs tend to have some, you know, some similar functionality. Some got some really clever stuff they do, but the most important thing for efficiency is being able to plug all of your additional tools into that one system. And it can save you, you know, half an hour, an hour a day on top, just using a CRM that everything plugs into. Um, so we hear all the time people saying they're going to build their own CRM. I cannot stress enough 99 times out of a hundred, how bad an idea that is. It's very, very rare. We speak to somebody who is nailed, building their own crm it sounds like a great idea in theory you can build a crm that is perfect for your business is customized for all your workflows and all that kind of thing but the problem is now what i've talked about there about the integrations the most important thing is that your crm integrates with all the other products because that's where you drive the most efficiency and for us as a technology provider if somebody has their own crm system there's no real like it's just there's no benefit to us in integrating because the only revenue we'll generate will be from that company from doing that integration so an integration might cost us 10 pounds to build and if we're only going to make that then back from 
that one CRM, it's not worth it. Whereas when you have mass market CRMs, you know that it's worth spending 10, 15,000 pounds building an integration because you're going to be able to sell that hundreds of times over. So um, CRMs that you can integrate with, really, really important. Um, I would throw a lot of caution at trying to build your own CRM because it tends to be a huge mm. money pit um, and you come out with something that isn't for, fit for purpose. All right. Well, uh, as opposed to having my chatbot talk to your chatbot, <laughs> chatbot maybe uh, maybe we could do something in person later in the year. Sounds good. Get you, get you and a few of the other tech whizzes around the table, have a couple of beers and discuss what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, sounds good. All right, Steve. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Dalton. Really appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Take care, pal. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.